welcome Dr. Julie Busby. Welcome to our scope. We have been out of touch. Life is busy. It's Christmas time. You're busy. We're all busy. But I think it's worth taking a few minutes to talk about holiday hazards for dogs and cats. We're going to include, include both in the scope. So welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm assuming if you're here, you have a dog or cat. And I hope I, if I just give you one little safety tip that is helpful for you, then it's totally worth being together in this these few minutes. I like to just say as a disclaimer that um, my daughter graciously helps me do these scopes because I am not tech savvy enough to do the whole thing. So that's why I'm, we're a two-man scope team. It's because of my own tech deficiencies. All right, so it's Christmas time. You may or may not have a Christmas tree in your house. We have a Christmas tree on our back porch, actually, for a, for a variety of reasons. But the first hazard that you should know about is that water. If you have a live Christmas tree, that water that stands in the bottom of the tree, it's a great breeding ground for bacteria. Dogs can go lick the water, lap it up, and it just causes tummy upset, it can, and it can make them pretty sick. Um, on the broad spectrum of how serious I consider things to be, and this is subjective, somewhat influenced by my own personal experience over the years, I don't think that's like the worst possible thing that can happen. But one of the objectives I think that we should always keep in mind as pet parents is keeping our, sets, our pets safe and thinking about proactively what can we do to help them avoid getting into trouble even if it's not life-threatening trouble. Okay, so Christmas tree. Water in the bottom of a live Christmas tree, dog or potentially even cat laps that up, they can get sick from that. The next one is a really, really serious one in my book and it's tinsel. I don't know if people even still use tinsel. Most of us who have pets have come to realize that it's a problem, but I want to explain why it's a problem. Mostly with cats, they like these, we call them linear, meaning you know string-like, whether it be yarn, tinsel, then you've got the shininess of the tinsel, and it's very attractive. And so they ingest this, and then you have something else. Hey, Camry Dog Training, thank you for joining. Glad to see you. Hey, thanks for coming. Yay for the Pet Lovers Tribe, showing up at the uh, holiday toxins and dangers post. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so this is why tinsel is a problem for cats. This is a little play uh, accordion, which my mom bought me in East Germany when it was still communist and there was still a wall. And, um, okay. And so this is what happens to the cat's intestines. Here's the cat's intestines. And when they ingest this linear foreign body, the, whether it be yarn or tinsel we're talking about now, but that string-like structure moves down the intestines and then it starts to, the fancy scientific word is plicate. It starts to kind of pull the intestines together. And you end up with that. And it's a really big problem because then the string is stuck. It doesn't move through, typically. And it actually can saw through the intestinal wall, like a foreign body. It can act like a sharp saw and, and work its way right out and, and cause a perforation in the bowel. So here's the intestine, long, many, 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 many feet of intestines. The tinsel or string or yarn is in there and placates, that's the fancy word, placates accordion-like behavior and you've got a really sick typically cat who does need emergency life-threatening uh, emergency surgery because this is a life-threatening condition and thank you for the hearts guys we so appreciate that and I know it's not for my accordion playing or carol singing all right thanks guys so Christmas tree tinsel I don't know what it is. What is it about dogs that they like to chew on crazy things? So I have seen dogs with burns on their mouth from chewing on electrical cords. I have seen dogs with cuts in their mouth and the worry of intestinal issues secondary to that from chewing on glass Christmas ornaments. I've seen dogs chew through batteries. So these are the kind of things that, again, just thinking proactively, you're gonna be busy, we're all busy, you know, potentially traveling or having family in, your schedule's off, you're busy. You're thinking about just the busyness of it all and visiting with your family, but be proactive, be intentional about thinking, 
okay, how can I protect my, my pet in this environment? Because it's ultimately our job. They're, they're not going to protect themselves, typically. So think about any sort of electrical cords that may be tempting, um, extension cords, glass ornaments within reach, and again, batteries, another thing that I've, I've seen dogs chew on, it can cause burns in their mouth. And so those are some of the, the holiday hazards that I, I worry about around this time of year. And then we get into the kitchen. And again, most of us are not, I worked at an emergency hospital for a while, and nobody came in and said, you know what, I you know, fed my dog this thing that I had read about online could be toxic. That's not what happens. What happens is people come in re like any accident, really devastated because they say, you know, oh man, this just happened in the blink of an eye. It was an accident, I'm so upset, and now we're at the emergency hospital on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning. And that's what we really wanna be intentional about avoiding. So foods that dogs should not be eating um, around the holidays. The turkey, the, the turkey skin is very high in fat. It can cause pancreatitis. We have a question? Yes, uh, is chocolate harmful to dogs? Yes, we're gonna be getting to that soon. And remind me to tell you about the scale of how harmful it is, but well, let's stick with turkey for now. So the skin of turkey is, is very high fat, and when dogs eat high fat food, it predisposes them to a condition called pancreatitis. That suffix-itis, I-T-I-S, on the end of a word means inflammation. So gastritis is inflammation of your stomach, um, tendonitis is inflammation of your tendon, um, and pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. And it can happen for a variety of reasons in dogs and cats, but one of the triggers that we know about in dogs is, and in cats is high fat foods. And it's really nasty. It's a bad disease. Mild forms may just be some GI signs, vomiting, diarrhea. Severe forms can be life-threatening. It's very painful. It's very expensive. Many days of hospitalization for the, for the animal on IV fluids. We want to avoid this mainly because we don't want our dogs to suffer through that. So keep these high fat foods away from dogs this season. Uh, the bones, these cooked bones are, are very dangerous for, for them. It can, once they ingest them, they can act as uh, little saws and perforate or poke through the intestines as well. Okay, chocolate, another question? Uh, how expensive can it be, I'm guessing, for surgery is what the question? If we're talking about surgery, like the cat with the piece of tinsel in the intestines, I mean, it can be literally 1500 to $3,500, depending on of course your vet has their own pricing and whether it's your local vet or you end up at a referral emergency center which are typically more expensive and how involved things are how simple or complex the procedure is and how simple or complex the recovery is but this is money you don't want to spend and um, again you don't want your poor pet to have to suffer through this because uh, most of these things we've covered would involve some degree of pain and suffering for the animal if not all of the things we've covered so chocolate, chocolate is toxic. It, oh, another question? No, no, uh, thank you so much for the hearts, guys. We really appreciate it. You guys are just uh, great. And thank you to um, uh, for our heart bomber. Oh, and Merry Christmas, this is fun. So we're talking about this stuff on the happy side, on the happy end, so we can all avoid it and have a very merry, peaceful Christmas, enjoying the people and animals that we love in our family together. So chocolate, toxins, there's this spectrum. So yes, all chocolate is toxic. And like any toxin, it's per body weight. So when we calculate, if you were to call, for example, poison control for a person or for your dog, the ASPCA poison control line, they're gonna ask you how much your dog weighs. Because if the Great Dane eats the same thing as a Chihuahua, it may seriously be a problem for the Chihuahua and yet not really be that significant for the Great Dane. Because the toxicity is based on body weight, just like we calculate drug doses based on body weight. So milk chocolate is the least toxic. Again, I would never recommend giving this to your dog, but this would be the least concerning to me. And it kind of moves up the scale to dark chocolate, and then you get to the semi-sweet, the baker's chocolate. We have chocolate in our pantry that's like 99% pure chocolate. It tastes horrible, it's not sweet at all, but it's for baking specifically. That would be the most highly toxic. It has the highest level of the, the compounds, um, methylxanthines, which are to and theobromine, which are toxic to dogs. Um, it causes them sort of this caffeine response where their heart rate's gonna go up, agitation, and then GI signs, vomiting, diarrhea. And so 
I really like the ASPCA poison control line. If you would ever run into trouble, I think there is a fee to call them. I mean, start with your own local vet, of course, but if you're stuck and you feel like you need answers and it's, you know, it's Easter Sunday morning and you can't get a hold of anybody, you can call and when you make the call, if you have a toxicity, you want to have as much information as possible. So have the bag, um, you know, heaven forbid it's like a rat poisoning or some other type of situation, but have as much information as possible so that when they ask you questions like how much does your dog weigh and what's the active ingredient and what's the concentration and what's the volume in the bag, you know, it's a 24 ounce bag or and how much do you think your pet got, you can answer all those things because that'll determine how seriously we need to take that toxicity. So yes, we're avoiding chocolate, we're ob for obvious reasons, we're avoiding alcohol. There's a really sad thing going around Facebook this year, we posted on our page yesterday, where um, a little child made a salt dough ornament, you've probably seen those before, and put it on the tree, and their dog, I believe it was a boxer, ate the ornament and became very, very sick. Salty, high, high doses of salt can actually cause sodium, of course salt is sodium chloride, can cause sodium poisoning. And this poor dog ended up um, seizuring, a body temperature I think made it up into like 105, 106, 107, and the dog had to be euthanized. And it's this tragic story that's all over Facebook and I, what I really admire is that in their grief and in their tragedy, the people are, the family is really trying to get the word out so that other people don't have to experience that. To be careful about salt to ornaments, and I would extend that concept to salty, you know, significantly significant amounts of salty food of any type. So, if a potato chip falls on the floor and your dog eats it, or a pretzel, really not a big deal. Although I wouldn't recommend those foods for dogs, but we're talking about a, a high ingestion of sodium to the point that it completely skews the blood levels and, and the dogs can get very sick and even and even can even be life threatening. So how can one tell if it's poison other like symptoms like uh, like chocolate that those kinds of things? If your dog eats something that you know can be poisonous, I would recommend you contacting your vet um, ASAP and for some reason if you can't reach the vet then going with like a poison control line. Um, and again, you can Google that. The ASPCA has a poison control hotline, and I do think there's a fee associated with it, but it's outstanding. You're talking to board certified veterinary toxicologists. So even if your dog's not showing symptoms, absolutely, if, you, if your dog has ingested something that you have concern about, and again, I think it would, I'm not worried about one potato chip, but a compound or enough of something that you think this could really be a problem, and I would say err on the side of caution, you should get help. Okay, now, uh, are there any fruits or veggies that are naturally toxic to dogs too? Yes, we're gonna move to that next, but let me go back to you should get help. Because by the time you wait to see symptoms, it could even be too late in some circumstances. Um, for example, antifreeze, caught very early. You can actually antidote that with um, alcohol, um, but, once the symptoms are there, it's basically a, a fatal condition, dogs and kidney failure, and it's irreversible. So I would not wait until, I mean, you may not even know that your dog got into something until you do see symptoms and think, oh, maybe he got into something. But if you see him or catch him in the act of getting into something that you know could be a potential problem, I would for sure get the counsel of hopefully your vet at that point um, and not just assume, well, let's wait and see what happens until we see symptoms because at that point, you might run into really big trouble that's even life-threatening, whereas if we were proactive early on, we might be able to change that, change the course of the outcome. And it may even be something, um, we had something um, at the hospital that I, where I worked for a while where the dog ate a large volume of, of pills and we caught it immediately, the, the owner was involved, we caught it immediately, and so in situations where the dog's eating something that you know can be toxic, we not always, depends on the compound, but we often induce vomiting so that we purge the system of it so it doesn't have to go through the whole digestion and absorption process. And again, that, that catching it early, being proactive, talk to your vet, I mean, I never mind when a client calls and says, you know, my dog ate three Hershey Kisses, and I say, you know, look, you know, I know your dog, he's a 105 pound chocolate lab, I'm not worried about three Hershey Kisses, but I would so much rather that than three days later, they call me and say, you know, my dog's not lifting up his head, and 
he hasn't eaten in two days, and then I say, what did he eat? And they tell me he ate five pounds of dark chocolate. So always be proactive. It's, it's the best thing for you and your dog, and ultimately your veterinarian, because we're all on the same team as, of wanting the best health for your dog. Okay, two more questions. Eggs, uh, eggs and caramel for dogs. Oh, those are interesting ones. Yeah, I don't mind eggs. Be, they have the same risk of, of humans as of um, bacteria. So there's debate on whether or not the dog's digestive tract is perfectly designed to handle bacteria. So it may not be an issue, but I would personally cook the egg and I don't mind an egg here or there. Um, it's not something that I would make a regular part of a dog's diet, but if your dog can tolerate it, it doesn't cause GI trouble. I don't mind eggs. Um, caramel, yeah, just not the kind of thing you want to be giving your dog. Not specifically toxic, but the sugar, you know, the artificial flavor, just, it's just not a, it's not a healthy thing for the dog. If you, if you think about what's a good thing for dogs to be eating, Think about what does the dog in the wild eat, you know? They're not eating caramels, and, and we can really kill our dogs with kindness. So it's really not doing them a favor to feed them those kind of things. Feed them raw carrots. Feed them something that you know is, you know, I don't mind if you even chop, chop up a few little pieces of very lean meat off the table and in moderation do something like that. But think about common sense, what is, what's good for my dog and what, what do dogs naturally ingest. Okay, so back to fruits and vegetables. For the most part, vegetables are fantastic. Um, I would say if that's not something your dog's used to eating, I would work up in moderation, small amounts, make sure they tolerate it. I love my, my owners that feed um, canned pumpkin, for example. I think that's fantastic. Not spiced, just plain old canned pumpkin. Uh, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, peanut, uh, uh, grapes and melons. Okay, yeah, we're getting there. So let's keep going on canned pumpkins. Grapes is a huge problem for some dogs. Not all dogs, and I have a story to tell you of my own dog that ate grapes a few months ago, and it was highly traumatic, so I can tell you a personal story with empathy. So, canned pumpkin, not the spiced kind, not with sugar, but I love that for dogs who have issues with anal gland problems. I'll tell the mom or dad just to start adding in a teaspoon or a tablespoon for a bigger dog of canned pumpkin with every meal. It may change the stool to be a little bit orangey, but um, it usually bulks up the stool and can be helpful for, for anal gland problems. So, for example, I mean, that's just a one illustration of when I actually use vegetables therapeutically, although maybe pumpkin's a fruit, I don't actually know. Anybody on that? Pumpkin, fruit, vegetable, uh, tomato, tomato. So, I, there's not a vegetable that I specifically worry about. Onions, raw, are a problem. Um, they can cause a problem with the dog's blood. But again, you know, common sense, probably not feeding your dog's onions, not a good idea. And in that same family, garlic, I, I, there's some literature out there that says it's fine. I know people use it anecdotally for fleas, but I would not do onions or garlic on my own dog. Carrots, broccoli, string, green beans, cauliflower, those are fine. Start small and work up, but um, if your dog eats vegetables, I think that's great. It's a good way to get um, fiber into them, kind of bulk up the meal so they feel fuller, but not a lot of calories, which most of our dogs need to reduce their calories. Okay, and what about peanut butter? Peanut butter, okay. So, let's keep, I don't want to forget any of this. If I forgot your question, please write it again. So let's go to grapes. Grapes and raisins, and I didn't, when I went through vet school 20 years ago, this wasn't even on the radar. But grapes and raisins, we now know are toxic to some dogs, it seems. I don't think they're necessarily toxic to every dog, or maybe it's not the dog that's the variable. Maybe it's the specific grape or raisin. I've even read literature that said maybe it was what was on the grapes, so you know, pesticides or whatever they put on these things when they produce them, maybe that's the toxic component, it's not the grape itself. Um, but I would avoid them completely because this is one of those things on the spectrum of how toxic is it which can be very, very serious. Um, I read an article from an emergency vet who um, treated a dog that had some grapes, and I, I think a small quantity, and ended up in full-blown kidney failure, um, very, very intensive and aggressive treatment, and the dog still died. It was really serious. And the veteran, the hospital where I work, we've seen a couple cases where dogs have run into kidney problems from ingesting grapes, although none of those were fatal, thankfully. So our own dog, um, he's an adorable little black dog. If you follow us on Instagram, 
which is Dr. Dr. Underscore Buzzbees with B U Z B Y S, no apostrophe, uh, underscore toe grips, T O E G R I P S. You'll see the black dog, lots of pictures of our little black dog, Zeke, who is so adorable and he's so bad and we love him so much. Uh, but, and then we have another dog, Luke. He's the brindle dog that you'll see on our Instagram account. And Luke is our little angelic dog that never gets into trouble and does everything right. Except for one time we did come into the house and find him standing on our island eating an entire pizza. Which goes back to being intentional at Thanksgiving and being proactive about thinking, how could my dog get in trouble in this scenario and how could I protect him? Because sometimes they just can't help themselves. But Zeke. So Zeke's our problem child and we love him dearly. And if you see his picture, you'll understand why. So Zeke ate grapes, which were in a bowl on a table. And we had, we hadn't, um, we had just rescued him from a, um, the pound only a couple months earlier. And we never thought about putting stuff away because Luke would never have done such a thing, the good child. So Zeke eats these grapes and I, and luckily we found it right away. I think timing is really important and I'm horrified because I'm thinking, okay, I mean, this could, worst case scenario his, here is we lose this dog and we're all, we have a, many kids, big family, we're all very attached to our dogs. So this is all playing out and you know, the, the dog's perfectly content at this point, nothing's happened, except for looking guilty because he knew he shouldn't have eaten these grapes out of the bowl, which was on a table. So I actually, as a veterinarian, I, I think I speak for more than just myself here. When you're treating your own dog, it's really hard to stay objective and you get emotional and it's hard to think straight. So um, I called um, a veterinarian that I work with, the owner of the clinic, because I just was not even thinking straight. You know, should I, it was on a weekend, of course, you know, should I go off to the emergency hospital because of his need for ongoing care and hospitalization 24 seven, you know, should I just go for like the, the big dramatic effect? Should I just go to the hospital where I work and kind of start treatment there, kind of see what happens? Or the most conservative approach would be to induce vomiting. And we had kind of an exact count of how many grapes were in that bowl. And so I talked to my boss um, at the, again, the, where I work, and we talked through it. And he was like, oh, Julie, you know, it's not a big deal. Just get him to vomit. But I, I knew, having recently read an article about how serious it can be, that, you know, worst case scenario would be really bad. So there was this overwhelming feeling of mom guilt, and it really helped me empathize for my clients because the shoe was on the other foot. Typically I'm saying, well, here's your options. And if they, you know, I will say, this is what I would do for my own dog and I'll answer all their questions. But now it was my choice to say, okay, I know my options and what do I think is best for my dog? So we started it with step one, which was, again, I had that advantage of it was all very fast. So within less than 10 minutes, probably less than five minutes of the ingestion, we had him vomiting in the backyard. And um, poor, poor little Zeke. So he's throwing up these grapes and we're counting the grapes and he threw up all the grapes. And it was because of that and the fact that they were in his system for such a short amount of time and I really felt pretty confident that he threw all of them up or you know, nearly all of them. I mean, I knew that there was not, if, if anything, we had maybe missed one. And um, so I, I decided that we, were, we did um, some fluids under the skin to kind of just help flush the kidneys, if you would, just prophylactically. And this was all a judgment call. I really don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. And prayed, and he was fine. But not a situation that we ever want to repeat. So grapes, raisins, they're high on my list of serious potential for serious problems in dogs, and avoid them. Okay, have we covered everything? We've peanut covered butter. Peanut butter. So a lot of my clients use peanut butter to give pills to their dogs. And if they do that, I'll always say low fat peanut butter because of the whole pancreatitis thing and just those extra calories. And I don't particularly mind that. But recently, peanut butter manufacturers have started to use xylitol. If you look at the label, it's X-Y-L-I-T-O-L. -L. I'm sure you've read about it on Facebook, etc. But my understanding is it's a sweetener. And my understanding is the reason that they do is because it's cheap compared to more natural things to sweeten um, sweeten things with. And so it's now affecting, it's in a lot of things. It, the f first thing I remember it being in was sugar-free gum. But it's in a lot of things now, and now it's in peanut butter. And it's really toxic to dogs. It affects their blood sugar levels, and it can actually cause liver failure. 
So in that sense, just be a label reader. And um, there's even some peanut butters out there that advertise, you know, xylitol free for dogs. Um, but if you're doing peanut butter and it is xylitol free, I would recommend in moderation because again, it's not one of those things that you know dogs in the wild are getting into. And so there's room for tummy upset and, and weight gain and those kind of things. So I wish you all a wonderful, merry, safe, blessed Christmas and Happy New Year. And if you want to find us, if you have any questions, follow-up questions, we have a blog now. It's The Busby Bark. It's on our website, which is toegrips.com, T-O-E-G-R-I-P-S.com. And we did a blog this week that covers what I talked about a little bit and even more about holiday hazards for pets. Go visit our blog. Lots of great stories on there. Any more questions? Oranges and pork. Oranges and pork. Good question. I find that dogs really don't care for citrus, but it's not specifically toxic to my knowledge. Um, not something that I would necessarily want to feed my dog either, but not. I don't worry about it from a toxicity standpoint. And pork is an interesting one. I know there's some pork-based diets out there. Subjectively, I think dogs, I think many dogs don't tolerate pork well. That's just my own opinion in terms of just GI upset. So can a dog eat pork? Yes. Would a dog potentially eat pork in the outdoors if we're using our you know wild dog diet test? Yes. Is it my first choice protein for a dog? Absolutely not. Do I think it can cause GI upset? Yes, I've seen it in many dogs. Um, if you're having pork loin for dinner and it's it's lean, again, low fat, so if you're doing some vegetables off your table for your dog or you're doing um, meat off your table for your dog, I would do lean, and so don't just give them the fat scraps. And then for vegetables, don't give them some sort of corn or something that's all slathered in butter. Just the plain old vegetable is what we're talking about being safe for dog, for dogs. So pork, if, you ha if you're having pork loin and you take a lean section and you want to chop up three little bites for your dog, you have my blessing. But as a rule, I like to, not, I'm not a risk taker, so I just kind of live the straight and narrow and, and avoid the uh, potential even for causing, for causing tummy upset. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we're so glad you, that you enjoyed this and have a wonderful holiday season. Thanks. Check us out again on our website, toegrips.com, T-O-E-G-R-I-P-S.com. Check out our blog. It's right on the navigation bar, and you can read more about holiday hazards for dogs. And you can message us there if you have a specific question. We'd love to be in touch with you. Um, we appreciate that you're a part of our community and we're a part of yours.